welcome to the simplicity of the gospel brought to you by the Pegwell Community Church of Christ Church in Barbados. I am in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'm going to read an extended portion because I don't want to happen in this church where there'll be a famine for the hearing of the word. As long as I, Lester Rudolph Merle, am in the pulpit, you will always get the word of God. It might be like, but please, it's going to be a little distasteful sometimes, but it works. Amen? As long as it's the word of God, don't worry about that. I'm going to read from verse 1, although I don't need all these uh, all this passages, but there's something in this text that you can learn. Every time you come to church, make sure uh, that you learn something. When I drop off my, my uh, granddaughter at Dayton Griffith on mornings, I tell her, make sure you come home this evening knowing something that you did not know when you're going this morning. Know something new. Something about something. So Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he said, and by the way, he's writing from Ephesus. He's not in Corinth yet. And he said, no concerning the collection for the saints, no concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given thee order in the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. What does that mean? He said, I'm going to collect some money to, to take to a church over in Jerusalem. I want you to collect it, put it aside, and make sure that when I come, you don't have to collect any money. This verse is not speaking about tithe and offering. This is a special gift they were given to help out the church in Jerusalem. And he said in verse 3, uh, verse 2, upon the first day, do it upon the first day of the week. You see, the New, the New Testament church goes to church on the first day of the week. The Old Testament church went to church on the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath. And although you will see in the Bible that Jesus went into the synagogue on the Sabbath, two things about that. Number one, Jesus lived under the Old Testament. Jesus did not live under the New Testament. Jesus lived under the Old Testament. And number two, if you want to go to church and meet people, what time you're going to go? You go when the people are there. So upon the first day of the week, put aside as God has prospered you. So you don't pay a tithe as God has prospered you. No, God has charged 10%. But this is a special offering. What is laid upon your heart to give to the church over in Jerusalem? Put it aside that there be no gatherings when I come. You see, there must be some order in church contrary to what people think today. There must be some order. He said, put that money aside. When I come, I don't want it to be any gathering. Verse 3. And when I come, whosoever you approve, whoever you approve to take it over to Jerusalem is fine with me. That's what verse 3 is saying. Now, concerning the collection of saints, let me just interject here that the church is supposed to do some work of looking after people who are needy, uh, including the Pegwell Community Church. We give a lot of money under the radar. I can guarantee you that our love offering account for the year is probably about $15,000. And two occasions that we give away food stamps, each time we buy food stamps, it's $5,000. And we give away twice it's $10,000 already. So the Bible says when you give, you don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So you don't have to come and announce to you, neither do I have to call the nation to say to somebody that I gave somebody two packs of hamburgers. Is that okay with you? Right, you don't have to do that. The church must look after, but if we don't have the money coming in, we don't have the money to do it. So I want to encourage some of you that are not paying your tithe and offering, and those of you who have reduced your tithe and offering, please bring it back up because there are persons calling at the door every day People are calling at the door. They want food stamps or, or make food vouchers or something. And, you know, the church has an obligation to the needy. The church. That's in James 1.27. You also, um, the church has to truly determine who the needy are. You don't just give money to everybody. That's the first Timothy chapter 5 and verse 3. Um, if, if you can be supported by your family, you're not supposed to be supported by the church. First Timothy chapter 5 verses 3 to 4. Um, and those who are supported by the church should make some return to the church. Come and clean the benches, cut the lawn, uh, do something if you are supported by the church. Um, and it is not right for the church to give to persons who can work and support themselves, but for the most part, they would not. Um, let's read that. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. If somebody can work, they should not burden the church with it with the, the duty of supporting them. For even when we were with you, Paul said to the Thessalonians, this we commanded you, it is a command, that if a man would not work, neither should he eat. Mothers are very often violating this scripture. 
because they say, well, the boy is down by, he's down by the block all the time, under the tree. He has a sensitive nose. He knows when the rice is dried down. He knows when the gravy is finished. So he said, boss man, I can see you. He gone home to eat. Wouldn't look for a job. When you challenge the mother, the mother will say, well, it's just a bowl of rice. And the more the boy will get to a stranger. You see the nonsense that comes into church from just reasoning? You see why you can't take that kind of stuff? Because the Bible said if you don't work, you should not eat. So don't tell me it's just, it's just a bowl of food. That's what he would just do for another stranger. He's never ever going to work. He's going to be eating up your pension every day. And sooner or later when you need a caregiver, you won't have the money to pay the caregiver. But the attitude is, and it's crept into the church. I hear Christians with this. You know, um, it's just a bowl of food. That's what you'll give to, scripture, to uh, a stranger. You're violating the word of God. But let's go on. Paul speaks a number of things here, a number of truths, beginning at verse 4. I want to hurry down to my text. And if it, if it be fitting that I should go also, then, then I, I'm going to go along to carry the, the, the food. Verse 5. Now I will come unto you, and when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I, I am going to pass through Macedonia, so I'm going to come by and see you. And he said a number of things there, which uh, time would not permit me to get him, but I'm going to invite you to, um, to read it for yourself. So I'm going to come all the way down <coughs> to verse 9. In verse 9, he says, in verse 8, I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. And verse 9, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. That is what I want to talk to you about today. That is what I talk, want to talk to you about today. Paul said to the church at Corinth, great door, a great door is open unto me, but there are many, many adversaries. Another translation would say, a great door is open to me, but there are many that oppose me. So I want to look first at the doors that are open to individuals. I want to look at the doors that are open to families. And then I want to look at doors that are open to the church. The doors are open, not opening or will be open. And sometimes we do not enter into those doors because personally we are our own adversaries. We're going to get to that in a minute. M my most favorite preacher is a Greek scholar. When he teaches, he teaches word for word, verse by verse, he goes into the Greek. And the Lord moved him 30 years ago from you know, from. United States of America to, to pioneer work in Russia. So for the last 30 years in Russia, Rick Renner has pastored a church of over 3,000 people where the Arvis church in Russia is less than 100. He's pastoring a church of over 3,000. As a matter of fact, he has more than one church now where his two sons are the pastors of the other churches. So uh, where God guides, he provides. Nobody would think that just as the, at the fall of communism, uh, he was sent by God. You see, when God sends you, he works with you. God is not going to di direct you to a place and doesn't work with you. I say all that to say that he's a Greek scholar that you could hear every day on their star television and it is around 4 o'clock in the evening, I make sure I'm home to listen to him. Because if you listen, if you keep spinning thought in mud, if you keep associated with people who don't know the Bible, who can't tell you truths, who can't uh, tell you anything about any scripture, then you are not going to grow. If you remain in that atmosphere, you are not going to grow. Nobody has anything to tell you. They don't study. They don't memorize scripture. They can't exegete scripture. What are you learning? So you should find somebody who ought to be able to teach you the word of God. So this is what uh, Rick Renner says. Uh, he says, think of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 16, 9. For a great door and effectual is open unto me. That was a great door that was open in Corinth. Previously to this, there was great resistance to the word of God. There was great resistance, but now all of a sudden, the door is open. So um, he is saying that during the three years that he lived and worked in Ephesus, he established great churches in Ephesus. As a matter of fact, one church in Ephesus became the, big, the largest church in the, in the world at that time. But it did not happen in, um, in Corinth. But now all of a sudden the door is open. 
Let me pause here and inject something that's not how many notes. But for some of you sitting in front, I'm glad I see some new, uh, some different young men in here this morning. Because God has opened doors for you. Doors are opened by governments. Go- doors are opened by self. Doors are opened by family. Doors are open. And in a, in a few minutes, if I could get down there, I want to show these young people the doors that government has been opening for you. Great doors have been opening for you, but there are great adversaries stopping you from entering. And one of the adversaries that is stopping you from entering is yourself. God has opened places where you could go learn all sorts of arts and crafts. You could go, out, you could go learn plumbing. You could do carpentry. You could do joinery. You, you could get in, go to Palm Marine and get involved in, uh, in the hotel business. You could get your city and guild certification. Uh, nowadays, with electric vehicles, they call them EVs. Um, they're going to have to be maintained because maintaining an electrical vehicle is different than maintaining a mechanical vehicle. All these avenues, all these doors are opening to you. But you prefer to sit on the block. Nobody is stopping you. These days, mayor has made it so easy that you could get into this place without qualifications. You don't even have to have CXCs to get in this place. So these doors are open to you. But, but, but you are your own enemy. Huh? You prefer to sit on the block and sell Akis. You know how many Akis you got to sell before you could buy a pair of shoes? Huh? You prefer to sell coconuts. Well, the price has just gone up from $13 to $15. Um, but you know how many coconuts you have to sell before you could buy a motorcycle? Or, or you prefer to sell drugs, sell drugs? Yeah, you're going to make, make fast money, but you're going to end up in jail where you can't sell any drugs anymore. Where you can't walk down Broad Street. You don't even know what Swan Street looks like because you're in jail for 20 years. Doors are open to you. Use of all backgrounds. This is not only for the white people, so get that out of your head. Doors are open for all ethnic backgrounds, all genders, all sexual orientation. If you're a boy thinking you're a girl or a girl thinking you're a boy, there's still avenues open for you and the church loves you. With your sexual orientation. We don't like what you do. But the church loves you. I'm making the point here. That doors are open. Especially in this country. I see some young people graduating yesterday. And getting certificates. Because the government has opened something else. Doors are being open. I'm hastening to get them to the church. Because doors are opening for the church too. Not, not all opening. Doors have been open for the church. But you'll be surprised to know the adversaries that are in the way. Doors are open, for example, let me get ahead of myself, for us to still keep people in church dressing properly. Especially on the platform. But the adversaries God come and say, he always talking about women should not put on what men wear, and men should not wear what women wear. And the scripture, you know, it's Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. It's scripture, but the adversaries. The doors open for you to keep decency I listen, somebody sent me yesterday a picture of a church with thousands of people and the pastor has a lady on the platform uh, just in a bra and a panty. He's using her as a prop. Well, that's what we want to want to. Every time I say something about dress, you all have to oppose it. And the door, listen brother, we don't have long before you'll be surprised who you're going to see on this platform soon from now. And I'm not speaking negative, I'm just looking forward. Doors are open, but somebody has to come up. With some sort of negative. Some adversary has to come with something. But don't let me get ahead of myself. Let me, I just want to whet your appetite. I don't want you to fall asleep. Let me tell you what Rick Renner says. Rick Renner says, if you look at that verse, it says an effectual door is open unto me. The word unto me means is uniquely for me, not for everybody else. This door is open for me. And then he said, a great door, a great. And the word great comes from a Greek word, which means massive. Could you imagine if you just go spend uh, three years at university and gain a bachelor's degree, you can understand the door that is open for you. You know Barbados like a lot, likes a lot of paper, and as long as you have some paper to, to, to wave before the boss which says they went to university, you know you're going to get a job. You know you're going to go to the top. You know you're going to get the best salary. You know you're going to be promoted. A great door is open. Some great doors are open for the church as well. But we are not there yet. A great door is open, young man. A great door is open. Get up on mornings. Have a shower. Brush your teeth. 
brush your hair. Go down to, down by me, the government has a place down there. There's another one up here, not far. And all these things, God is lending money. There's something called the YES program, Youth and, and entrepreneur, Entrepreneurship, what's that word? Skiing, huh? you know that? He's lend, they're lending money there. Everywhere, they're opening in Barbados. And you have the opportunity. You could be as dumb as a bell. They're not even asking you for any qualification. Doors are open for you. Brethren, they're telling me that Barbados don't have enough people. So they're going to have mass migration. Then you wake up in the morning, Chinese are going to be living one side and Indians the other side. And people from Afghanistan will be living in your back and somebody from someplace living in your front. That's what it's going to be. And you know how Barbados is? Depending on your color and how straight your hair is, that's going to determine whether or not you get a job. And unless you try and, and walk through these doors that are open for you, you are going to be trouble. I lived in St. Croix. Where the Crusians had no say in St. Croix. Because St. Croix is United States territory. So the people with the money came over from Puerto Rico. Because Puerto Rico is United States territory. People from the mainland came down. Bought up all the land. Built the big houses. Owned all the businesses. And whenever you see a Crusian, all he says is, Me born here. Me born here. I mean, I was born here. But we got to show for it. We're going to end up like that if you're not careful. I'm trying to do some foundational work before I get to the church because a mess as to what people want to do in the church to turn back the clock and, and turn the, stop the church from moving on. So, so uh, when it says the word great speaks of something that is huge and massive, he said a great door and effectual is open, is open, not shall be open or anything like that, it's already open. And when you put the two of those words together, it says that these, this door is standing wide open. Maybe somebody here is applying for a job. Maybe another door is open. Maybe one will open this week. When you put this message together with some serious prayer, God will direct you into what door you should walk into. As a matter of fact, I have here, maybe I'll get to this tonight, I don't know. How do you know that the door that you're walking through is from God? How do you know that the door you're walking through is from God? I could tell you, number one, although I'm getting ahead of myself, is that that door will never contradict the word of God. You're going into a job and all of a sudden you got to sell monkey rum. Or you got to sell condoms. Or you got to sell Playboy magazines. Then the door that opened by God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. I set all myself because you all getting scared. Those are jobs that not, that's not open. When God opens the door for you, it will never contradict the word of God. Never. I listen now on the radio in horror. We are here, we are here Christians on radio, and I know they will tell me because this crap is coming into the church, hook, line, and sinker. Well, I got to keep food on my table. And if you hear the music that these Christian people got to pay on VOB and these other broadcasts, you would not believe that these are Christian people that we would say big up in the church. But the next thing you're going to hear is, I got to keep bread on my table. You think God didn't know that? And people who should be an example. If you hear the music that they play, I listen in horror when I hear Christian announcers playing such crass music, you will not believe. But everything is filtering into the church. And it sounds good. It sounds reasonable. It sounds intelligent. It, sounds some, it comes from somebody who has a master's or bachelor's or PhD. You know? So, as long as they're okay, it's fine. It doesn't matter what God says. So, you, you can always tell when the job, the door opening is of God. A great door is open. It's standing wide open. Paul had a lot to say about these adversaries because he had a lot of adversaries. Look, I have here in my notes uh, just a line in red. It is underlined. It's bold. It is, in, it is in a very dark script. And it says, don't be an adversary. Get involved. Don't be an adversary to the work of God. Get involved. We're going to get them there later on. There are too many adversaries to the work of God. 
They forget that God has given instructions. He has leaders. He has people working with him. He has pastors who are watchmen. He has pastors to whom he speaks. The Bible said that the Lord will not do anything unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. If you're not his servant, the prophet here revealing it to you. So shut up and let his servant, the prophet, do what God has called him to do. Amen. Hallelujah. Preach, pastor. You're preaching better than again. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Just do what the Lord says to do. There are too many adversaries. The word adversaries come from a word which really, really means that. But it speaks of one that's laying around ready to tear down everything that you do. You could check this in Strong's Concordance. These are easy things that I know you could check on me these days so I don't come with things that I don't know. When you hear about adversaries, it talks about uh, hostile forces that are standing in opposition to someone. Hostile forces that are standing in opposition. Paul said, I have host uh, doors open to me, but I have hostile forces that are standing in opposition. Listen, you go to work and say you want to buy a car. And see the hostile forces that are in opposition. You crawl out from under the, under the bench. And you can pay for that. You think you can be able to pay for that? Why well, you want such a big car? I want a big car because I got six children and me and my husband. And we all got to get into it. Can I hear amen to that? Why well, you want, uh, you, you, I can't go buy a house out in Coral Ridge. Why well, you got to live up there for? You come from St. Patrick's where the pigs used to be in the backyard. Why well, you want to go in the development area for? The people, hostile forces, always ready to cut you down to size. It happens in church too. I'm reminding you of that till I get there. It happens in church too. You try to work for the Lord, and I tell you, there are hostile forces that are around in opposition to you. These forces are literally lying all around, pitted against a common foe, and just waiting for the opportunity to strike. How many of you want to be a pastor? How many of you want to be a business owner? I'm talking about business later on. Because I want to, when I'm talking about doors open, I'm going to be talking about open doors for education. I'm going to talk about open doors for family development. I'm going to be talking about open doors for poverty alleviation. You don't have to live in poverty. As, as a matter of fact, if you're a child of God, you should not be poor. I'm not saying you should be a millionaire. But I'm saying you should not be living from hand to mouth. That's not what God has for us, really. So we're going to be talking about doors open for you to... To, to really know what you want in life and to go after it. Anybody getting anything so far? Anybody? What I'm talking to you about this morning is this. Paul said to the Corinthians, a great door is open to me. You would have thought that you would let a man like Paul go ahead and do what God called him to do. A man that wrote half of the New Testament. I mean, by that time he had not written it yet. A man that died and went to heaven and God revealed to, think, to him things that nobody ever got, like the communion services more, nobody ever knew about that, and, and other things. And he has such great revelations that the Lord said, look, before you go back to, to earth and open your mouth and say things that you shouldn't say, I'm going to give you a thorn in your side. You, you remember that scripture? Because the revelation was so mighty for him. You would have thought a person like that would have had free access to go and do what God called him to do. No, nothing so fresh. Anytime we find ourselves standing before a rare door of opportunity, people with impure motives and jealousy will appear on the scene to see how they can steal the victory we work so hard to achieve. That's what Rick Renner says. You'll be surprised to know that when you read Greek words, it says a lot more in Greek than it does say in English, you know, like love. We talk about love. We have one word for love. Greek, you have four words. So a man could say, I love my dog, I love my car, and I love my wife. He'd use one word, but not in Greek. So what I'm saying here is really a translation from what the Greek language says. Paul was very aware that there were deceptive people opposed to him and who would have loved to remove him and steal the place that God had given to him. Adversaries. God has opened a door for you, but everybody is trying to stamp on your head. I want the young people to know this morning that God has opened a door for you. Not that you have to go work for somebody and start working for yourself. Go buy a weed whacker. There's so much money in the weed whacking business these days that the, that the white people are involved in it now. Come and talk to me, somebody. And if it's decent and you come by me, you got 81 houses in my area, you got 81 houses to work on. 
81 houses. You ain't gonna work on them every week. Doors are open for you. If doors are open for you to build houses for government, do good work. Don't be your own adversary. Uh, don't let people that work for you before you be your adversary. Because when your business has shut down and left you with thousands of dollars in debt, they're going to go on to work for somebody else. Can somebody say amen to that? If doors are open to you to work for government or anybody, you got to do good work. Of course, when you work for government, you don't do good work because you can pay somebody to make sure you don't do good work. And the work is usually sloppy. In almost all areas where people work for government, it's all, look at driving buses. They leave transport board, know that the bus doesn't have any diesel. They know that if diesel runs out, the bus can't move. You've got a lot of work to do. If you run to gas, you could go pour in some. When you run to diesel, you can't do that. You've got to bleed the wheels. You've got to unscrew this, unscrew that, let out the air. You know what you're talking about? Let out the air and all that. And so you're getting paid for a whole day and nobody ain't get transported anywhere because you're working for government. If you're working for me or Carl Williams, you'll get fired before you leave the yard. Can anybody say anything, anything to what I'm talking about this morning? I sound like a politician. I sound like I'm preaching. I'm even preaching this morning. I'm teaching. Amen. Because I want you to get up off your behind. I didn't even realize that the older you get, let me cut to the chase and say, today went to, yesterday went to collect some medication. And having received half of it free from government, having received half of it free from government, I still had to pay over $1,000. You understand what you just said? You think it's easy to get older? These spectacles that I have on here cost $1,200. And if you're not working and you're just living on your grandmother's pension, you're going to an early grave. Or you're going to be going to see Mr. Whoever is with the homeless. Anybody understand what I'm saying? You see, jealousy and covetousness in others is an unfortunate reality that often manifests when God's opened the door of opportunity for you. Jealousy and covetousness will come up. That, that's why it's so imperative that you learn how to be discerning. Not everybody that comes and smiles in your face is, is, is your friend or is working with you. You ought to see you've got to have this gift of discerning of spirit. So, so has, is there anybody here right now you can wave a hand at me and say that God has recently opened the door for you? Well, you've got to look for the vultures. You've got to look for the adversaries. You've got to look for those who are jealous and ready to cut you down to size. And if you're a pastor, the same is true. In this particular church, lots of pastors don't like their members to come to this church because they feel that when they come to this church they, they, and they got the ambience of this church, they ain't going back to theirs. So they don't want them to come. So when you have a conference, whereas I will give them this church free of cost, free of electricity, free of water, free of everything, no, they'll go to a hotel and pay two or three thousand dollars for, for two or three hours. And you can get it here free. Why? They have to find a neutral place. A neutral place. That's what happens. So Paul said, a door is open unto him, but there are many, many adversaries. Um, so, how to begin to open doors of endless possibilities in your life? How, how can you begin to open doors? If the door is not open yet, how could you begin to open doors? Have you ever allowed fear to hold you back from exploring something you've always wanted? Yeah? Well, the answer to that is stop allowing fear to hold you back. Fear. False evidence appearing real. They tell me 95% of the things you fear never come to pass. 95% of the things you fear never come to pass. That is why over 365 times in the Bible, the Lord says, fear not, or be not dismayed, or something like that. Because fear works just like faith. It is just in the reverse. You have faith in God and you receive certain things. Your fear is actually faith in the devil. And you'll receive what he has to offer as well. So the Lord is saying to us, fear not. So if you are stuck, and not expanding, not doing this, that, or the other because of fear. Stop it. Uh, another, another way that you could open doors is, let me ask you a question. Have you ever built up a wall of excuses and reasons why you couldn't possibly go after something that you dream of? 
Well, I ain't qualified. Well, I ain't got enough money. Well, I don't live in the right uh, place. I don't live in the heights. I don't live in the, the, the towers. I don't. And, and you, so you know what to do? Stop making excuses. Anybody hearing me today? Any door that's open to me? Look, I've had about five or six jobs in my life. I never like any, the only job I've ever liked in my life is the one I'm doing now. I work because I had to work. But every time an opportunity arose that I could get more money, I said, bye-bye. Start off teaching, the bank offered me some more money. I said, Minister of Education, goodbye. I went to Barclays Bank, a Royal Bank offered me some more money. I said, the Barclays Bank, bye-bye, I'll see you. I'm at Barclays Bank and a firm of charter companies called Coopers and Lyman offered me more money. I said, Barclays, bye-bye, went to charter companies. I'm at the charter companies and a company called Gas Products Limited offered me to be an accountant. And I said to Coopers and Lyman, bye-bye, gone to Gas Products. Get work for Gas Products for a lot of money, $3,000 a month, 30 years ago. That's enough, enough money. They sent me to St. Croix to work at another gas station. And then when I was in St. Croix, not at the gas station, the gas company. They made oil, Hess oil, refinery, refinery. Uh, then I went to Bible school, came back to Barbados, accountant at Motor Services, and then a place called Concrete Products offered me some more money. I said, bye-bye Motor Services, you keep your cars and whatever, I gone. Uh, then, then, then I went to, uh, to Concrete Products and decided, I'm making half a million dollars for you every year with my own brain. Am I stupid? Why am I not making that money for myself? So I left, went in competition with them, made $75,000 the first year as a profit. I had my own business. And because I had no money to start the business, it was called Faith Enterprises Limited. Everything you did, you did by faith. You understand? So this is the first job that I ever liked. Maybe that's why I like it so bad. I'm saying that you've got to have this mentality. Every time I go to somebody selling snow cones, I ask them, is this your cart? No. Well, why you don't get your own cart? If I go to buy hot dogs from somebody, I ask them, is this, is this your place? No, so you and the hot son selling hot dogs for somebody that already got money. Why you don't go borrow some money but you own hot dog cart? Oh, this is not Sunday morning messing, huh? so you want to remain poor. Huh? God is opening, opening doors for you and you find the excuses as to why you can't walk through those doors. Listen, if they ask me to be prime minister of this country now, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't step down. No, I wouldn't step down to be prime minister of the country leaving the Pegwell Community Church. No, 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 I wouldn't do that. But if the Lord had asked me to do something, maybe, I don't know, I can't I have excuses in my mind, but uh, open doors, fear, getting yourself in the way, not having somebody to teach you. Man, I'm so glad that I have this job. Three ways to know that the open door is from God. Number one, God is not going to lead you to contradict his word. If you have a job right now, that you are doing something that is in contradiction to God's word. In other words, the little bit of money that I get in this, shop, in this church now, if Montgomery Distilleries would dip double or triple that pay and ask me to come do accounts for them, no. I'm not tabulating your money that you're making people drunk. No. If I had to go into a place where they ask me to sell pornographic magazines, even if they double my salary now, the answer is no. If I go to a job like you usually do with women, you go to a job and you're working behind the counter, fine. next week they ask you to sell the rum. Then the next week they ask you to sell the cigarettes. Then the next week they ask you to sell the vaping, vaping stuff. And then the next week they ask you to, uh, to sell the, the, the wrappers for the, for the marijuana and all that. And you find yourself so far away from God. That ain't God. That is not God. No matter how much money you're getting, that is not God. God will not put you on a job where you violate scripture. Another way that you know is that God, when God leads you, it will be accompanied by some form of confirmation. That is why I have a beef with self-appointed prophets. You know, we did that last week where the Lord said to this church, I got sent against you. You have that woman there that calls herself a prophet. She's a self-appointed prophet. And you're, she's teaching my people, because the pastor stupidly allowed her, she's teaching my people to commit fornication, to eat things offered to idols, and some other third thing. Remember that? And the pastor, something was wrong with his head. He's trying to make friends and influence people. 
you see that the person is in wrong doctrine and you can't correct her, you can put her back to preach all the time. Something, let, let's, let's see that scripture, Revelation chapter 3, to that church at Thyatira. If you look for false prophetess, you will find it easily. There are no self-appointed prophets. Uh, if you read Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, you'll see that they were assembled together. And as they were assembled together, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work we have called them. And the Holy Ghost separated them. And the church continued to pray. And then sometime after, the church laid hands on them and separated them. If you are not separated by somebody into a prophet, you are a false uh, self-appointed prophet. Nobody should listen to you because that is dangerous. What's that? Not that. We're going to get to that church later on. So, when you, are, when you are going into the open door, chances are, not chances are, it is going to be accompanied by confirmation. I'm going to give you some scripture right now. Let's forget this and go to uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 and 16. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. There's some confirmation. If you come up in this church and say, uh, God calls you to be a pastor or God calls you to be someone in the faithful ministry. Before you even recognize that, somebody in the church will tell you. Some old lady in the church will come to you and say, you, 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 you testify good. You don't even testify, but you want to be a pastor. You don't even testify, but you want to be a faithful ministry person. How's the pastor going to know your qualification? How's the pastor going to know what you have in you if you don't even testify? He's just going to wake up one morning and put you to be, the, to be, to be a Sunday school teacher or a prophet or, or one of that. No, no, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Just like it calls for confirmation with some, when something happens to a believer in church. You see, the Lord says you don't just go kick out a man out of the church like that. That you talk to him. If he doesn't listen, you take somebody with him. Uh, with you, and if he doesn't listen to you, you take you to the church. The same thing happens when you're appointing uh, ministers. You see, because people's life and death depend on it. And when I say life and death, I don't mean here. Eternity depends on what that prophet tells you. Eternity depends on what that pastor tells you. You could vet everything the pastor says because I'm here in public, but you can't vet every time the you can't vet everything that the the secret prophet tells you because they tell you a secret and there's nobody there to tell you. Look, she's talking foolishness or he's talking foolishness. That's not how it should be done. So any prophet, did you find that scripture for me down there? False prophet who calls herself a prophet in the book of Revelation. If you get those words, I want you to see this. Because there are people in church today, they are pastors, and they seem Revelation 2.12. There are persons in church today, they are pastor today. Tomorrow, they are apostle. The next day, they are chief executive officer, and they are never satisfied with the name that they have. And they are all self-appointed. That's not what God says. I didn't hear it again. Revelation Revelation 2, somebody tell me, Revelation, we're talking about the, the self-appointed uh, female to the church at Thyatira, I think it was. I want to see this for a reason. I can't hear you the mass on. No, not, not Jez, uh, we're not talking about Jezebel. The, we have the one, this woman who calls herself, who, huh? Revelation 2.20, could you bring that up in a hurry? Because you have a lot of self-appointed uh, ministers in the church. Notwithstanding, he says to this church, I have a few things against you, church, because you permit that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. Nobody didn't call her a prophet. Nobody didn't set her aside. Nobody didn't lay hands on her. Nobody didn't have a discussion with her. Nobody didn't give her any children. Even in the Old Testament, you had the school of the prophets. If you want to be a prophet in the Old Testament, you went to a school called the School of the Prophets. But you wake up one morning, decide that you're a prophet, and you start pontificating on Facebook or wherever that you are a prophet. According to this scripture, that ought not to be so. But number two, I blame the pastor. I blame the pastor because he ought to know the doctrine well enough to know that this woman should not have been teaching. And if she got up and teach something, it is his responsibility when she is finished to tell the church even before they leave, look, in some nice kind of way, look, um, I, I, think my, I think my sister made a, a mistake right here because here, here's what the scripture said and here's what she said. Here's what the scripture said and here's what he said. It is the pastor's responsibility. But it is filtering in the church these days. The pastor is not supposed to do that because if he does that, he's offending somebody. 
That doesn't make any sense. So look at this verse one more time. You have this woman Jezebel there. She calls herself a prophet. And look what she's doing. She's teaching and seducing my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Why did the pastor allow that? He got to be backslidden himself. He would have to be backslidden himself. But if he's not backslidden, she got up and maybe by error or water, whatever, some error has come out of her mouth. It is his responsibility. It is his responsibility to correct it. Because your eternal life depends on that here. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Your eternal life. Anybody's with me this morning? Are you with me? Your eternal life. Pastor, you can't allow that. You can't allow that. Now, people will come into the church and see that this sister ain't doing anything. And there's a pastor, you've got people in church that could do things, and you've got them doing nothing. Oh, yeah. All right, let me leave that there and move on to the third reason why. Uh, so I said, number one, how do you know the door is open from God? Uh, it will never contradict the word. Number two, it's accompanied by confirmation. God will confirm it. And number three, it is usually a case where God will require you to depend on him. Where God will require you to depend on him. So, so um, if you have an open door, make sure that it is of God. Remember that these doors will not be open much longer. The end is coming. The doors that are open to the church will not be open much longer. We have open doors for us into evangelism. But the adversary of money, where do we get the money to buy the buses? People don't walk to church at night anymore. But the door is open. What's standing in the way? Glad to see you from all the way down Silver Hill this morning. Thanks for coming. Amen. Amen. Glad, glad to have you. you came, how you came? You, you, you came by bus? You got a right? Okay, normal. Okay, good. Say how you tell me you go back home. All right? People, yeah, people in Silver Hill, they want to come here. The door is open. The door is open for evangelism. Brethren, these days, we don't even have to sow the seed. If you, if you shake the tree, the fruit will drop off. If you shake the tree, the fruit will drop off. The Bible said the harvest is plenteous. Say that with me, everybody. The harvest is plenteous. In other words, pay attention, pay attention. In other words, if you look up in the tree, you will see so much fruit up there. The harvest is plenteous. Nowadays, we don't have to go and do a whole lot of work in evangelism, you know. The harvest is plenteous. But what? But the laborers, not the church members, are few. Not the Christians are few. That's not what the Bible says. Because you have church members and you have Christians that are not laborers. So the Lord was very precise with his words. And he said the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So you see how the doors are not being entered into? A big door is open. But we are not entering into it. I think we'll deal with the church tonight. Door of evangelism. Why is Paul able to say these things about, about, about the, the, the opposition that he had? Paul had so much opposition that you would not, you would not believe. Let me tell you some of the, the opposition that Paul had. And for that sake, let me call him Pastor Paul. Is that okay with you? Pastor Paul. He had, his adversaries were demons. His adversary was Satan himself. His adversary was the betrayers that all around him. His adversaries were what he called false apostles. In John chapter 11, verse 47, in fact, let's get Matthew chapter 16, 1. You will see the Sadducees and the Pharisees who are supposed to be the, the religious creme de la creme of the day. Even the Pharisees and the Sadducees were against him. They were his adversaries. And what did Paul do wrong? From the time Paul got saved, before he got saved, yeah, he did a lot of foolishness. He went up there and he persecuted the church. But after he got saved, what else did he do wrong? Why did he have to come under such opposition? You know why? Because the God of this world, Satan, 
the Bible says, has blinded the minds of people so that they don't see. Satan has half of the church blinded, especially the half that's not filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, so that when you begin to speak spiritual things to them, they don't understand. And the Bible says that the flesh is enmity against the spirit. The Bible also says, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So if I'm making some plans in the spirit according to what God tell me, and you come to give me things in the flesh, we ain't going to agree. Because the flesh and the spirit are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the thing that you would. So look at this. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came tempting, desiring uh, uh, that he would show a sign from heaven. That's where they were tempting Jesus. But you go down a little bit further and you'll see just as they tempted Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees, they tempted and opposed everything that Paul had to say. Well, let me personalize this because some people think that you shouldn't call names in church and there's some times that you should not call names and there are other times when people will light on you and say you call names when you haven't. But look what Paul said. Demetrius was in Ephesus. He was the one who looked after Diana the goddess. You know how much she opposed Paul when he found out that they, that they were not going to make any more money by making false goddesses? Talk to me if you understand what I'm saying. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, Demetrius. For a certain man named Demetrius, it's on the screen if you want to read, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana. He brought no small gain unto his craftsmen. Diana was this goddess. So people make some little figurines of her. Demetrius used to make these little figurines and sell them. After the people got saved, they were not buying the figurines anymore. So Demetrius is vexed. So he called together the workmen. The workmen said to them, Sirs, you know that by this craft we make our money by selling these little figurines. Uh, verse 26. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but all through Asia, this man Paul has persuaded much people so we can't make no money now. And turn them away saying that there be no gods which are made by hand. So he had Demetrius is an adversary of Paul. And Paul is telling the truth. Paul is saying there are no gods made by hand. But they made a lot of money by selling these little figurines. Give me an amen if you understand what I'm saying. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So suddenly you do things that people don't understand. You do things as a pastor that people have ulterior motives. Okay. They don't understand what you're saying because their knowledge of the Bible is limited. You know, it's as if you go to a doctor and tell him your belly hurt to you, a hundred things going through his head. Because a hundred things in there could be heard. But you only know about one. All you know about is the air that your grandmother tell you about. So you can say the air in my belly causes my belly to hurt. But the doctors think about a hundred different things. When you are talking to me, I'm thinking about a hundred different things about scripture. Because I could go from revelation. Not that I'm perfect, not that I know everything. God forbid. But I could know things that you don't know. And when you're looking at one thing from a particular perspective, I could look at it from a very Varying perspective. So Demetrius gave Paul a lot of trouble, but the door was open for Paul to minister, to win souls into the kingdom, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to raise the dead. A great door is open, but Demetrius is looking at money. In church today, people are looking at social mobility. In church, they want to use the church as a stepping stone to get up. In, other, in some cases, it has to do with uh, with nepotism. You want to get your people, your family in a position in church. And all sorts of things happen in church. And uh, The simplicity of the gospel.